Get ready. Get set. Go! Mad scientists. Life! Life, do you hear me? Give my creation life! And giant spiders. Holy cow. Cloning. Why did they lie to us? You're not real. You're copies of people out here in the world. We have live coverage. Public landmarks wiped out by massive climate change. <laughs> Falling through wormholes. Science or Hollywood science? Hello and welcome to CU Science Update. I'm Jenna Browder. What we see in movies and TV can often take artistic license with science, distorting, sometimes badly, the natural laws of the universe. For instance, in this poster from the film E.T., The Extraterrestrial, we know that the moon is never this big in the sky. Or when starships come into contact with black holes, we often learn that gravity sucks. I had a professor who predicted that eventually black holes would devour the entire universe. Why not? When you can see giant suns sucked in and disappear without a trace? But the answer, of course, is that the ship is falling. There are plenty of movies that are not wholly believable, but we can't expect the writers to get it right all of the time. You often hear them say that a good story will always trump good science. Whether the science in films is good, plausible, or horrendous, they get us wondering, thinking, and maybe inspiring us to find out the real answers. Here to talk about the science in films is Sidney Perkowitz, who was invited as a guest to CU's 63rd Annual Conference on World Affairs. A research scientist turned author, he's written several books about science while remaining a physics professor at Emory University. His latest book, Hollywood Science, explores how science and scientists are presented in film. We were lucky enough to have him drop by for a chat with CU Science Update's Beth Bartell. Well, welcome to Boulder for the Conference of World Affairs. Thank you, Beth. We are very happy to have you. And today we get to talk about um, one of my favorite subjects, which is science and scientists in the movies. Great. And um, yeah, I would love to focus on that. You've written four books and some screenplays. Um, the most recent book was called Hollywood Science. You're working on another one, from right. what I understand. It's in press. Right. Due out in June. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, but, but yeah, I really want to talk about um, Hollywood science, because it's sort of a little love of mine. Um, <laughs> so um, what, how has the depiction of scientists in movies changed over time? Well, there are more women, for one thing. So that's been a big, big plus. In fact, I've asked a lot of colleagues, who do you think is the best scientist portrayal of all time? And they all say Jodie Foster in Contact. So just as a scientist, but also the fact that she's a woman is a real bonus. So I think that, that's the biggest improvement. It's not always just a beautiful bimbo sitting on the side kind of helping the scientist. These are really scientists. There's also a good woman geologist in a Volcano, if just to give one more example. Right. And what do you think, what, um, what makes these characters good scientists? Um, I, I, well, the, the, uh, if it's a woman, it's okay if she's attractive, but she can't be ridiculously glamorous because then you're in a different arena than the average working scientist, male or female. And you have to show the dedication. Jodie Foster showed the dedication in that film, in uh, Contact. She really worked hard to get her ideas across. Right. And that's the definition of a good scientist and a good scientist portrayal, I would say. And have there been particularly bad portrayals of scientists that just... Yes, and I hate to say this because he's a favorite actor, Brent Spiner, who played Commander Data on uh, Star Trek. And everyone loves him, loves the character, and loves him. 
did a really goofy scientist in um, Independence Day. A truly goofy, wild-haired, lisping, totally crazy out of touch scientist. So that was, that was almost demeaning, I would say. Mm -hmm. And was it speaking to scientific stereotypes? Yes, of course. And of course, a stereotype takes characteristics that are not completely wrong. So scientists maybe are not as social as some other kinds of people, that's true, but then carries them to the ultimate extreme, and that's when you have a stereotype. Do you see any changes in stereotypes over time, too, apart from gender roles? But have you seen changes in, like, mad scientists to respected scientists? Have, there been tr have you seen any trends like that over that's time? A, that, uh, okay, yes. One change is which scientists are the villains. Because in the 50s and 60s and 70s, when nuclear war was still fresh in people's minds, it was a nuclear scientist. Now it's always a biologist gone bad, because biology is the hot area now, and you can do good things with DNA and bad things with DNA. So those are the new villains. For instance, a movie about cloning. Movies about cloning, you'll have uh, biological scientists going ro rogue who are making clone, human clones for all the wrong reasons. And what, so you're a physicist. Right. Or, do you have a favorite physics movie? <laughs> <laughs> or a least favorite. Let's or a least favorite. Right. Least or favorite. Either, yeah. Well, you know which ones worked better than I thought? Most of the movies where an asteroid comes in and hits the Earth are pretty accurate in the scale of damage that they show. In fact, uh, one of them, Deep Impact, it looks like they actually went out and found a paper, a real, a serious journal paper, and kind of copied the calculations. So they got that part of the physics right. Uh, but the ones that get it wrong are, are almost too numerous to mention, but I say the core is, is one of the worst. This is the one where the Earth's core stops spinning, and that part is accurate. We do have an internal part that spins at a different rate than the rest of the world. It's very fascinating. The inaccurate part is it stops spinning, and the solution they come up with is horrendous. They're going to send down a, a team of scientists and engineers and explode H-bombs to set it spinning again. Seems like a terrible, terrible idea. And what about, um, what about the actual cause of um, the change in rotation of the core in that movie? That, and that's true. That has a political segment because in, in, the, in the plot line, it's because the U.S. has been testing a new kind of secret seismic weapon. So it's that weapon testing that screws up the internal rotation of the Earth. So there's an anti-militaristic stance, a little anti-militaristic message in the movie, too. Right. Um, uh, what, do sci what do movies generally do better, the scientists or the science? I think probably the, the, the science. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's, it's not so much that they're not so good at, uh, at doing the scientists. We're mostly talking about science fiction films, and science fiction has never been much about character development. So I'd say none of the characters are, are done very well, including the scientist. Mm -hmm. If you have a scientist in a, in a true dramatic movie, then he or she might be represented as well as any other character in a good movie. Right. Have there been changes in, in character development over time? Are we any more demanding now than people were in the, in the 50s? For Actually, I, I think less. And I, I think yeah. the problem is that special effects have gotten so great that if you pay 10 bucks to see a science fiction movie, you're mostly paying to see incredible special effects. And the characters and the plot line and so on are all kind of secondary to that. What's the last movie you saw in the theater? Uh, oh, God, I have to think. Uh, it was the one where, uh, new, where uh, we reached the end of the Mayan calendar. Was it called 2012? 2012. Yeah. yeah, that was it. Yeah. And what was, that was your favorite part? What was your favorite part of that movie? <laughs> <laughs> okay, what was your least favorite part of that movie? <laughs> Here's a part that caught my attention. Okay. When, they, when uh, we're finding that humanity is going to have these wonderful arcs in which to float after the disaster hits. Turns out the arcs were built by the Chinese, and one of the characters, I think Oliver Platt was the actor, says you can always trust the Chinese to do a great job. Well, that's just because they could sell the movie in China. So I thought this was such shameless, cynical product placement, it really lifted things to a higher level. This went way beyond whether the science was good or bad. Right, the politics There were a came, billion yeah. people that want to reach there, so they put in a, a nice pat for the Chinese. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so, do science in movies do, um, I guess, does having inaccurate science in movies, embellishing for the sake of entertainment in 2012, in Day After Tomorrow, both of which mm. I went to the theater to see because special effects 
mm -hmm. and bad science. Mm -hmm. I mean, good science, whatever. Great. Um, does does having this um, embellished science do more harm or help? I think uh, if, if 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 the scientific community thinks about it in a smart way, it can do more good than harm. I teach a course called Science and Film, and what we do is, is have the students see whole films or show clips in class. The dramatic part grabs them in a way that a straight science course often won't. Mm -hmm. This is a course for non-scientists, by the way. And uh, then, even if the science is wrong, you can, you can sit back and do an analysis of why. So, for instance, in my course, uh, the favorite movie that we all analyze together is Starship Troopers because it has these giant 8, 10, 12-foot bugs. And we sit down and do a quantitative analysis of why you can't make a bug that big. So the students learn something about scaling laws in nature, which is really fundamental stuff. You know, chemists, biologists, physicists, geologists all care about this kind of thing. But their attention is drawn because I show them this really exciting trailer from the movie. It's a phenomenal trailer. It's brilliant cutting. I mean, you end up breathless after two minutes of this. You're, it's just a beautiful adrenaline rush, but then we get into the science. So the science is exaggerated. You can't have 12-foot bugs, but you can turn it into good science and get people's attention on it. So that's a great teaching aid for you, but right. what about in absence of, yeah, in that's, absence of, of Sidney Perkowitz? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Uh, mm -hmm. What do we do about it there? I think all you can say is when the movie is big enough, like The Day After Tomorrow, it gets out to be part of the general conversation. So there's no reason a scientist can't write a, an op-ed piece or make some other comment about it that will set, set the record straight. Moreover, the, uh, these films, uh, um, again, bring people's attention to the issue. After Day After, after, Day after Tomorrow came out, the sociologist did a study of how it had changed people's perceptions about climate change. It made them much more aware of it. So it's, it's a question, was the fact that it hyped, a hyped the issue a bad thing or a good thing? Well, all you can say is it made people more aware. It's still a bit ambivalent, but there's something very interesting going on there. Right. What was your main motivation for dropping the research and focusing on, hmm. on writing? Is it because you think science is fun <clears throat> and writing is fun, or because you saw a need to educate the public, or a combination, or something completely different? It, it, a lot of it's personal, but I, I, I want, do want to say that writing is more fun than being in the lab. And, and you meet different kinds of people, which is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So I've met all these Hollywood people, which is really great. My dream is to meet Jodie Jody Foster. I don't think that'll ever happen. It's a lot of years since she made that movie. But the personal thing was I turned 50, very significant age, and I published my 100th paper. I figured that's enough. Thank you. <laughs> Time to move on to another career. And I always thought writing would be a great career, so I jumped right into it. Um, and you write for popular audiences. That, that's my hope, right? <laughs> <laughs> and was that, is that the type of writing you enjoy, or did you specifically decide that, that you wanted to reach a broad audience? Specifically, and, and as, as, a, uh, as a pushback against writing 100 journal articles, which is a very rigid, stil stilted kind of style. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to write something where I felt freer, more creative. So this kind of writing has given me that. Um, and you've written several screenplays as well? One screenplay and a One couple of uh, stage plays. Okay. Stage plays were produced. A screenplay has not sold to anybody. Just to lay that right on the table. <laughs> if there's anyone out there... <laughs> and, and is the screenplay, by any chance, is that a, uh, a, uh, a, um, a piece on bad science? Is it a big, multi-million bad no. science movie? No, I see it as a drama that has science in it. Okay. Special yeah. effects? No. Oh. No. So it would you could probably make it for twelve million dollars cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and do the um, the stage plays have science in them? Yeah, they're, uh, in fact, they're both uh, the two that I wrote are both about scientists. One about Rosalind Franklin, who's the DNA, the woman who did a lot toward discovering the structure of DNA but didn't get full credit, and one about a, a, a Russian mathematician, not so famous, who found a flaw in Einstein's theory of relativity, and turned out to be right. And this guy, his name is Alexander Friedman, actually is the great-grandfather of the notion that we have an expanding universe. Einstein didn't figure that out, and, and this gentleman did. So it's quite an interesting story. There's a good bit of science in it, but also a lot of drama, because he, this guy was a military pilot in World War I, 
for the Soviet, for, it was Russia changing over to the Soviet Union in this era. And because he was such a great mathematician, he could calculate bomb trajectories better than anyone else. So in a way, he did more harm than any of the other pilots. So there's really a moral question about how you use science in warfare. So his life is quite an interesting uh, mixture of all kinds of elements about science and science and society. Yeah, so uh, in military and science has come up a couple times now in our conversation. Do you yeah. have any, uh, any interest or thoughts in writing a book uh, addressing military aspects of science? I had thought of writing a book about uh, this group called DARPA, which is the arm of the Defense Department, which encourages far-out research if it has potential military application. And they've, they've looked at things like mind control of weaponry, things like invisibility. You know, it sounds like pure science fiction. I didn't write the book. Someone else did. And it turned out to be kind of a dull book. So I'm glad I didn't write it. Apparently, I had a misjudgment about it. But that, that was the only book I've ever thought of writing about it. Let me ask you one more question. Sure. We're just about out of time. Um, what do you think about the state of science literacy in the U.S. today, where are we relative to where we should be? Oh, it, it, it's brutally bad. You know, uh, e even the keynote address we had here today at CWA talked about the state of American education in general and in particular in, in science. It's brutally bad. People do not know uh, that the earth goes around the sun. People do not know why, why seasons are formed. People know DNA as a word but don't know a anything else about it. I think we've totally failed in having an educated citizenry that can deal with issues like genetic engineering, should we or should we not have nuclear power, or even to put it really on a si the simplest level I can think of, why are fluorescent bulbs uh, an important choice to make over incandescent bulbs? We don't have people who can think about these issues in a rational way. It's a terrible failure. I don't have a good answer for it, but the failure is there. Is there a particular scientific principle that you wish everybody understood? Ah, yes. If everyone could do math just slightly better, things would open up enormously. That's really all it would take. Those look like engineering schematics, almost like blueprints. It is our belief that the message contains instructions for building some kind of machine. A machine? It might turn out to be some kind of a transport. Transport? There is one film that comes close to being error-free in terms of science. 2001, A Space Odyssey, a classic from 1968, gets it right when, aside from the music, no sound can be heard in the vacuum of space. But in early 2011, NASA put out their picks for the most scientifically inaccurate movies of all time. At the top of their list is the film 2012. We'd like to thank Sidney Perkowitz for stopping by and sharing his ideas with us today. More shows to follow with other guests from the 63rd Annual Conference on World Affairs, so stay tuned. In the meantime, you can watch other CU Science Update shows on iTunes or visit our website at www.cusciencepdate.com. And don't forget to like us on our Facebook page. And the next time you watch a science fiction movie, ask yourself, did they get it right? Thank <laughs> you.